You're listening to sermons from Southbridge Fellowship in Raleigh, North Carolina. We pray that today's message helps you to connect to Jesus for life change. We've got an incredible passage of scripture we're going to look at today. Let me say this uh, before we crack open our Bibles. Today is one of those messages where if you get the information and lack the application, you get an F. That's in a class, but it's like an, or an E, like I don't know, what, what do you get here in North Carolina? An E or an F? I didn't grow up here. Fail, E, exemplary disaster. All right, it's bad. So this is one of those, like, we got we to gotta do this. We can't just hear it. And so I'm going to pray. I know Pastor Bryce already prayed for our time in the Word. Uh, Lord willing, you've been impacted just by greeting people and singing the songs. But I'm going to pray that we wouldn't just be hearers of the Word, but be doers. Let's, let's pray together. Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, everybody here who has the Spirit, that you would empower us to do your word. And if my interpretations or applications are wrong, I pray we'd miss all that, forget all that. But we'd do what you say. Will you speak through me, even if it's different than first service? And uh, will you speak to us? A variety of stories happening. Some great, some rough, some disastrous. Uh, I pray that you do what only you can do. Correct, rebuke, encourage, challenge. Uh, give life. For some, this will be a pep talk and a reminder. For others, this is life-altering information. I pray that you would do all of that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we get started today. I want to ask you, and for you to internalize this, you don't have to respond verbally to this one, but I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. What's the best deal that you've ever been a part of? For some of you, maybe when you were a kid, you traded your bike for a baseball card and everybody thought you were a fool. Now you've retired. It's like the Honus Wagner rookie card. I got Oral Hershiser, so I'm still working. And uh, some of you, maybe it was a business deal. I was just reading about great business deals uh, this week. Maybe you were one of the first people to buy Bitcoin. I saw that in 2009, uh, the first sale of Bitcoin was for fractions of pennies. And I think it was uh, 5,050 of them sold for $400. <laughs> It's worth $30,000 for one today, this morning, before first service, and it's about $150 million. $400 for 100 that's a pretty good deal. I don't know if that was you. Or maybe you were the guy who bought two pizzas, was the first person who bought a real-world item with Bitcoin. Um, the value of the Bitcoin that he used to buy those two pizzas is $600 million today. <laughs> that was in 2010. Oops! Good pizza, I hope. Good deals, bad deals, probably been part of all of them. I think for myself, I had a mentor who after he saw my wife said, all you have to do to have a great life is get one smart person to make one really dumb decision and you're all set. Slightly offended after (laughs) realizing what he really meant by that, but what about you? What's the best deal you've ever been a part of? And we can debate historically What are some of the best deals that have ever taken place? You know, we've bought land as a country. Every land that has been owned by a country wasn't won by war. Some have been purchased for pennies on the dollar. Just crazy cheap prices when you think about what they're worth today. What about you? What about history? Some of you have seen the movie that's come out recently, Air. Not really about Michael Jordan, but about Michael Jordan's contract with a certain shoe brand. And I don't think I'm ruining the movie by telling you it's Nike. (laughs) And I'm not going to tell you all that happens in the movie, but just historically what happened in that deal, it was revolutionary, not just because of the money that was made, but it actually shaped culture. And so to even talk about trying to put yourself back into 1984, 1985, some of you were there, others of you were like, wow, was that like Civil War, like black and white, did everything, did did you live in color? I understand that. But this was a time before Michael Jordan was the famous, legendary, transcend sports, and even our country, uh, fame. He had never jumped from the free throw line to dunk the basketball, hadn't won a single NBA championship. Well, no one was arguing about whether he was the greatest of all time. He wasn't even the first guy picked in his draft. He was the third guy picked. And endorsement deals were not then what they are today. In fact, Nike was not what it is today. It was a running shoe. Uh, Think Brooks, if you're thinking of what it is. Not a bad shoe. It's just people aren't wearing it because it's trendy and cool. Sorry if you're wearing Brooks. We'll just assume you're a runner. (laughs) But it's not its own culture. Its uh, basketball division for Nike was not doing well financially. And they were trying to decide what to do to either close it down or revive what was taking place. And there were internal arguments about that. 
but there was this kid, Michael Jordan, North Carolina kid. Somebody came up to me the first service and said, I played against him. We went to middle school together. I had a jumper over him. He had like 8,000 over me, but I had a jumper over him. And, and uh, he's just this kid that's coming out, and the Bulls were terrible, and he was gifted, but not who we know of today. And Nike decided to go all in and recruiting him. He told USA Today, I had never wore a pair of Nikes until I signed my deal. I didn't want to even go talk to Nike. My parents made me go out there and talk to them. I'm a Converse or Adidas guy. Those were the cool shoes then, just so you know. And he thought that he would wear Adidas. The movie talks about the months of ups and downs and negotiating and what took place and that whole deal. But essentially what happened is Nike went all in. They made him a big offer. And then Adidas matched it and said, not only am I going to give you the same amount of money, we'll also give you a Mercedes. <laughs> what ends up happening is that Nike thinks that maybe over a four-year period of time that they could sell $3 million worth of Jordan shoes. Um, this is how it's turned out. There's a business historian. 1984, Nike hoped $3 million in four years, and actually now they make $3 million every five hours. It's changed the world. No one could have known that when he signed his deal, a five-year deal for $2.5 million, that when they put the shoes out and he was supposed to wear them in the NBA, they'd get banned from the NBA. He wouldn't be allowed to wear them in a game. And that was one of the best things that could have happened to Nike. Because Michael would have been fined $5,000 a game, and instead, Nike said, we'll cover it. And then they ran a commercial. Banned. On October 18th, the NBA banned these shoes. Fortunately, they can't stop you from wearing them. And then... He got game, Denzel Washington wears them, Jake Shuttlesworth, some of you have seen that, others of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Notorious B.I.G. would wear the shoes, Jay-Z would wear the shoes, they became part of pop culture. Financially, the revolutionary part of the contract was, not only was it five years, two and a half million dollars, but on every pair of shoes sold, Michael would get 25%. Those shoes that were banned, made $70 million in two months. The original shoes sold for $65 a pair, under $100, $65 a pair. And they made over $100 million on those shoes. Today, it's estimated based on Michael Jordan's 2021, 2022 earnings from Nike that he gets about 5% royalty on all Jordan brand apparel from Nike and makes $410,000 a day. It's $150 million a year just from his Nike deal. He makes way more money from that deal than he ever did playing basketball. No one knew he'd be one of the greatest of all time. No one knew those pieces would happen, that Jay-Z, who's that even, would wear those and a movie and couldn't have predicted it, but it was revolutionary. Changed culture. Can you imagine having that much money? 410, if you just didn't do anything, did I didn't buy anything, skipped the drive through Tomorrow you'd have 820,000. And then after that, 1.2 million. It just keeps going. It's like you're getting, eventually you're getting so much money, you can't even spend the interest. And so I want to ask you a question, and it's not a trick because we're at church, but I want a real answer now. Um, you can raise your hand or whatever you want to do, but um, if you had that much money, what would you buy? Not like, oh, first I got to give it to Jesus and the Malachi and bring it in the storehouse. I'm not going to Jesus juke you. If, you. if you tell me a mansion, that's fine. One lady in the first service, she's like, I'd buy a house. And I go, oh, okay. And then she started elaborating. And then it'd be this tower. And I'm like, you've thought through this. Like some of you <laughs> have. And so, so just curious. I've got a mic if you want a mic. But who, what would you buy? What would you buy? Anybody? Airplane. Airplane. All right. Do you know how to fly or just want one? That'd be, Kyle, I see you. What'd you say? What do you got? Okay, there we go. Ice skating rink. Ice skating rink. <laughs> One at a time. What do we have over here? I don't even know what that is, JP, but all right. You get one, bring it up to the church, and let me know what it is. A Supra. Is that a car? Yes. All right. Toyota car. Some of the, there was like almost an argument in the first service between Porsche and Lamborghini. So I get it. I hear you. What else? What do you had? Some a couple came over here. Hockey team. Hockey team. NFL team. NFL team. Somebody wrote me after the first service and said you'd buy the Lions. I was like, no, <laughs> no. Already got enough problems. I don't need that. Jeez. 
Anybody else? Anybody else? I got sports teams. You can buy a, a politician. Oh, they're all, I don't know if any of them are available, but if you're watching, we've got a buyer here. Back row, back row. Hands up. A toupee. All right. Camera. If you can scan, you'll understand what he was saying there. Um, someone might want to meet our friend and help him. But, uh, okay. Why don't you just buy the Eagles? You got so much money. One more, one more. What was it? Horses. Oh, that's nice. There you go. Now, and then think about too, like, well, you have so much money, you might as well give some away. And you don't have to answer, but you see needs out there. What would you do with that? Like, you can make a difference in somebody's life. And every person here, you know, when we kicked off this series at Ephesians 2.10, there's a universal calling for all of us first to come to Jesus and then how he sends us out, but there's also a unique calling. So some of you might be burdened for people that are hungry or people that are, don't have clean water or, you know, human trafficking, something our church gets involved with, like different things. There's different stuff you might think about, education, some of you. And, but think about the best deal ever is the gospel. We had a debt we couldn't pay, and Jesus paid it for us, and then it doesn't cost us anything to receive his payment. We just surrender our life to him and he begins to transform our lives. Gives us freedom in Christ, relationship with God, new identity, new name, equips us, implants the Holy Spirit himself inside of us. Pretty awesome deal. He also gives us a mission. A lot of people wonder, what is God's plan for my life? So when I said to you at the beginning of the message, if you have information and lack application, the failure is a failure to walk in God's clearly stated plan for your life. A lot of people do it for a lot of reasons. Number one, we get distracted and we accept hollow or empty versions of what is eternally longing in our soul. And so I titled today's message, Trading Hollow Ambitions for Timeless Significance. The passage of scripture is a popular one. It's Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the beginning starts with, he's Emmanuel, God with us. The end is, he is with us to the end of the age. In between, he calls some followers, dies, pays the penalty for all of our sins, and has risen from the dead. Now, it's probably harder than imagining a time when Michael Jordan's fame didn't transcend culture or sports. Football teams wear his gear. He didn't play football. <laughs> but imagine a time when Jesus has just risen from the dead. Rome is in charge of the world. The Jews have turned him over. You left everything to follow him. Maybe you're Mary Magdalene and he casts demons out of you. Or maybe you're Mary's mom. Or maybe you're Peter and you're an outspoken but often wrong, personality. Or Thomas, who's doubted but was incredibly courageous. Let's go die with him, John 11. Or Bartholomew, who's just quiet. Maybe that's you, more reflective. Nathaniel, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Maybe Whatever personality you fit. Imagine you're one of those people. Jesus had not just the 12, one of them killed himself, Judas, after betraying Jesus for money. It's uncertain times. There's a conspiracy theory. It's in Matthew chapter 28, verse 11, that Jesus died of COVID. Just kidding. <laughs> there is a conspiracy theory. Now do I have to offend the other side too? At any rate, I'll try to be an equal opportunity offender. I'll get you later. Um, he was vaccinated. Just kidding. Just kidding. Good stop. Refocus. Just for myself. The, there is a conspiracy theory, and the conspiracy theory we get we get to see behind the scenes. There was a guard. There were guards, actually, at the tomb of Jesus. Why? Because they knew that Jesus had predicted that he would raise from the dead. There aren't guards at every tomb. But it says that the leaders paid, somebody said they wanted to buy a politician. Did you know that it's not new that you can commit crimes, but if you have authority, you can just pay people not to talk about it? That's what happened. So... We want the guards to say the bodies were stolen, but if you're a guard, you're going, no, I'm not saying it got stolen on my watch. We'll pay you enough, and we'll make sure you don't get in trouble. Okay. And that was the theory that was out there. But Jesus has appeared post-resurrection to over 500 people at this point. 
these women have gone to the tomb expecting to find a dead body. He's not there. Angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Amen. It's always Easter at Southbridge, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then Jesus appears to those women again later, and they fall at his feet, and he says, tell my brothers to meet me on this mountain. We don't know which mountain. It was just in Israel with a group from our church, about 55 people, and Pastor Dave said, some people think it's this, it doesn't say which mountain, but he's on this mountain in Galilee. And the disciples are there. And I love how honest the Bible is. Because you think about these men and women, they're grieving. And if you've ever lost a divorce, a loss of a loved one, like if you've ever experienced loss, you know what sociologists and psychologists will tell us, that we go through stages, anger, negotiating, denial, depression, eventually acceptance. None of them have gotten to acceptance of his death. Now, they're being accused of a crime. Not only were they, you killed the guy that we're following. Everybody knows we were following him. They're hiding in a locked room. Jesus starts appearing. But now the politicians are saying, they stole the body. And Jesus is saying, meet me on this mountain. Ah, we don't know. Uncertain times, unlikely people. And look at what happens. The Bible's so honest. Verse 16, Matthew chapter 28. Now, enter into this moment. The 11, not the 12, one guy killed himself. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Which one? We don't know. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But, and this is where I love the honesty of the Bible, because if I was just trying to prove the resurrection, I would never say this. But I can see if I was actually living in the experience, I would experience this. It's first-hand knowledge right here. Some doubted. So they worshiped and doubted. Oh, some of you worship today that way. Yeah, but oh, it's like I want to help my unbelief. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth. No kidding, you just defeated death. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, some of your translators say, therefore, go. It's connecting the authority to the going. Go, therefore, and make disciples. That's our only command in this passage. Of all nations, baptizing them. This is how you do it. It's a participle. Baptize and teach. Two participles there. And go is another participle. So that's how you do it. Make disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe. Not just to know. It's not information an application to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, or the King James, lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Hmm. All times, always present, all nations, all authority, all that you've learned. Pretty all-encompassing. Pretty overwhelming. Put yourself in their spot. Unlikely people, the very fact that they're available when Jesus calls them to be disciples reveals they had not been picked by another rabbi. The way that it worked in Jewish culture is that from ages 6 to about 10, you'd be trained in the school of knowing the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. And they would memorize the first five books of the Bible. Think about that. Some of you set out to read the Bible in a year. Leviticus is in there in the first five, okay? Okay. Don't do that, it's bad. You should, outside the camp, unclean, outside the camp. Un- okay, Papa Zit, get out of here. Like, it's just like, wow. They memorized all that stuff. They didn't have chapters and verses. Pull the scroll out, read this direction, <laughs> it's Hebrew, and uh, memorize the whole thing. So they memorized that. The people who are really good at it would eventually, there's more schooling, get called to follow a rabbi. The rabbi would give you their yoke. Everybody knows the scriptures, they're assuming. Their yoke is the way they interpret those things and how to actually live this stuff out. You know how Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Yeah, he's the one who does the work. It's inner transformation that then overflows out of your life you could never do. Other teachers are giving things that are, this is hard, this is heavy. So when he calls Peter, Andrew, Nathaniel, all these different guys to come follow him, They didn't cut it at school. So they had to go get a trade. Not bad. Just you didn't have a rabbi. Every student of a rabbi wanted to be just like the rabbi. That's what a disciple was. A duplicate 
of the rabbi. The rabbi was picking disciples who he thought, I think that you can do what I do and impart the yoke, the teaching that I'm imparting to others. Interesting who Jesus chooses. Other people had already rejected them. It's grace implicitly taught in who Jesus is. And then the way he teaches is as he's going about, hey, do you see this fig tree? How about, and he gives sermons, he sits on a mountain, gives sermons, but they pick up who he is as they spend time with him, but they could, like, we could never be like you, Jesus, and, and now you're leaving and you're telling us to take this message everywhere, all nations? We don't even have TikTok, Jesus. Like how, there's no like YouTube video we can pop out? Now listen, we got a team in Madagascar right now. We got a team that just came back from panel. I've been to Madagascar where they don't even have roads and there's out in the bush. And the kids have cell phones with solar panels on top of their huts. Steve Jobs figured out how to get to these people. So can we get Jesus to them? All nations? When you speak their language. But I've given you a brain, solve the problem. Go. It's overwhelming. So, how do we do this? And that's what we're going to talk about in this message. Three points in the outline. We have to have a certain mindset for this to take place. No reserve, you're all in. Nothing left in the tank. No backup plan. No reserve. No retreat. And that is our tendency in Christian, at least American Christianity. We'll huddle up together, create our own culture. No retreat. No regrets. Requires long-term thinking to have no regret. Do you think... Michael ever looks back and goes, you know, Adidas did throw in a Mercedes. Hmm. I doubt it. Now, Run DMC did have a song. None of you know what I'm talking about, do you? My Adidas. But they weren't Jay-Z, and they weren't Denzel Washington, and they weren't Spike Lee, and no one would have been saying, like Mike. He had to think long-term. Not the Mercedes. I'll take the Uh, to quote Kevin O'Leary from the Shark Tank, in perpetuity. That means I'll keep getting paid forever. Now, it's not really forever, but what God's offering, yeah, eternal dividends, eternal repercussions. And these guys did it. And that's why we're sitting here. How? No reserve. Look at this. Uh, they went all in because it's an all-encompassing command. Uh, there's just grammatically going through this passage, only the one command. There's only one main verb in the passage. It's make disciples, which means to make duplicates. And why would we do this? Because it says here, Jesus has, and we just pop the verse back up and maybe underline the all statements, because I've told you before in teaching how to study the Bible, uh, when something's repeated, it's being emphasized, all authority. Okay, what does that mean? All authority. They've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him have authority over diseases. They've seen him calm the storm. So disasters. So he can heal lepers and open blind eyes and tell lame people to walk and calm storms and cast out demons. And, but now he's standing there alive and they know that he was crucified. And so while other people might be saying they, stole the, they know they didn't steal the body, Jesus is life. Pause and think about that for a second. We quote John 14, 6. Usually as evangelicals, it's in a battle against pluralism. And we talk about he's the way. There's only one way. He's the way. I've said it. Get it. But it also says he's the truth. So as followers of Christ, we shouldn't be afraid of the truth because our Savior is the truth. And so anything that is true is going to ultimately get us to Jesus. So you might be wrong about some things. We've got to humbly say, I want the truth. But it also says he's the life. What he's saying there is that you can't have spiritual life apart from me because I'm the one that connects you to the way, the God who is life, Genesis 1. He speaks things into existence that were not, not not out of the dust. He He does that too, but there was nothing, and then there was because he spoke. And then John chapter 1, Jesus was part of creation, and then the light of life, Jesus comes into the world, and he says he is the life, and now he's standing there Having defeated death, death doesn't have power over him. All authority in heaven has been given to him. Now let me ask you this question. If you're those men and women, do you not think to yourself, you have authority over life itself. You probably should have authority over my life. And whether you're a Christian or not yet a Christian, that's something to consider. If Jesus really rose from the dead, now you've got to wrestle with that. That's a huge statement. 
that shouldn't he have authority over your life? And if I ask you, do you want to know God's plan for your life? God spoke to me this week. He told me his plan for your life. Do you want to know? Most Christians will go, yeah. But then would you do it? Because it's here. Statistically, I read a study, George Barna study this week, uh, 40% of Christians, 39% in that study, um, of Christians would say they have no relational connection to discipleship whatsoever, meaning they're not being, like they're in no intentional relationships for the sake of spiritual growth. That's all I'm talking about with that. I'm not saying they have a rabbi and they're trying to be just like the rabbi. No, I'm not saying that. They're not in a small group. They're not in some meetings with other believers that are intentionally for the sake, through relationships, growing them spiritually. 39%. How do you even say you're a follower if you don't follow Jesus? He said, here's the mission. It's weird in America. Well, I believe the right facts. I, I checked the box on the survey, and you believing something true doesn't change anything. It's true whether you believe it or not. It doesn't change you either. And that's the key. A disciple is being transformed. It says here, baptizing? What is baptism? Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward transformation that's taken place. If you haven't been baptized as a follower of Jesus, I invite you, go to the Next Steps table in the lobby today, sign up, we'll get you on the list, we'll talk to you about it, make sure you understand it and all those things, um, and then we'll baptize you the next time that we baptize people. But it's not you getting wet, it's not going through a religious ceremony, it's not just checking some box or washing away your sins, the Bible doesn't say any of that stuff. It's an outward expression of an inward reality, and so what we're talking about here is, when he says go and baptize these people, saying these are folks that you've poured your life into and then now they have the same thing that you've been given and you didn't lose anything in the process. Actually, you're going to get heavenly rewards. The people that you influence here for Jesus are your crowns in heaven. And so you have eternal life. Nobody can take that from you. And as you give it away, you just get more. Is there a better investment than that? In perpetuity. For all of eternity. Why wouldn't we do this? A lot of Christians in surveys say, I don't know enough. I would just say this, and not to like, put that off too much, because it's the job of a pastor to equip you for the works of service, Ephesians 4. But see John chapter 4, there's a woman there. She's known Jesus for like 30 seconds. She leads her entire town to Jesus. <laughs> so how much do you need to know? You need to know him. It says, teaching them to observe what I've commanded you. Now, you might not know everything he's commanded you. Okay, teach what you know. Give what you got. Share what's happened to you. But what if they ask this question? We've gotten this weird thing that's happened within Christianity where we think because of apologetics, which are good, engage the mind, that's all great, but you can't argue anybody into the kingdom. And so what's happened to the majority of Christians then is like, I just don't know all the questions. Like, how do I talk about creation and evolution and how to, the Bible and how it came about and why does God allow bad stuff and ah, uh, share what you know. And if they ask you the question, you go, I don't know. I know he's changed my life. I was blind and I could see. Everything I've commanded you for them to be transformed by, it would actually change them. See, the problem is a lot of what happens that's done in the name of discipleship is actually demonic. What do you mean? Well, think about these guys being scared here. Uh, Jesus showing them his authority. Mark chapter 5, there's a story where he goes uh, to a man who's possessed, uh, the man of the Gerasenes, a demoniac, and we are legion. Remember that? Um, what happens in that passage is they come to Jesus, they cry out to Jesus. Think about what the demons do. They cry out to Jesus, say, what do you have to do with us? You're the Christ, the Son of God. Oh, wait, so they've got better theology than the disciples. Disciples don't even know this at the end Mark chapter 5. Still trying to figure this stuff out, what that even means. And then they say, can you not throw us, like, can you throw us into some pigs? And then pastors always mess this up because they get you just distracted with deviled ham and when pigs fly and like all that kind of stuff. But when we're like making corny jokes, uh, they obeyed. So the demons cry out, have right theology, and obey. They could pastor most of our evangelical churches. Problem, they're not transformed. The demons are not disciples. The disciples know that to follow Jesus, you gotta go all in, no reserve. How do they know that? 
Because he's told every one of them when he called them. He didn't say, can you click like on my Twitter? We'll be good. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus is not Mr. Beast or Kim Kardashian, like whatever. He's not these people that are like, if you just give me some attention on social media, Gary Vee, like whoever, pick whichever genre you want. It's Jesus saying, you need to come be like me. And so you walk in my footsteps and you do everything that I would do. And the disciples know that because when they were fishing, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. Drop your nets. You're done with that job. You're with me. Um, Nathaniel, who said there's nothing good that comes out. You've got to leave that way of thinking. I'm going to trans- you're going to see greater things than I know what you're thinking, Nathaniel. John chapter 1. Mark chapter 2, Jesus has just professed himself to be God in front of the religious leaders. They can't believe it. When four guys drop their buddy through the ceiling while he's teaching, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And they think to themselves, didn't say, only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus says, so you know I have the authority to forgive sins? Get up and walk. The guy gets up and walks and it says, everyone, that includes the religious guys who are mad at him. What he's just done would be considered blasphemy. They're amazed. He can call one of them a Pharisee to follow him. He can call anybody he wants. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Hey, Matthew. Oh, fundraiser for terrorists, tax collector Matthew. Leave the booth. You're with me. All in. Not, um, let me sell the licensing deal over here, and I'm going to get some profit, and I'll help fund your ministry. No, you. You're with, all in. No reserve. Come on with me. I remember when I was in college. Um, I was an international business major. All I want to do is tell people about Jesus. The only subject I like studying was not business calculus. Sorry, teachers. It was the Bible. And God was wooing me into ministry at that point. And I went to one of my mentors at the time. He was an English professor, Dr. Spencer, Edward Spencer. I said, um, I think I want, might want to go into ministry. I don't want to be a pastor. I didn't like the church, by the way. That's a longer story. Um, but I said, um, but I think I'm going to like study history or psychology, or maybe uh, some other thing that's useful in life. And he said, would you want your surgeon to do English as his major? I was like, no. He goes, why are you setting up a backup plan? God's going to call you to do something. Go do it. Hmm. I think it's wrong to, what do you say, hedge your bets, or and investments to diversify your portfolio. But with Jesus, this is not diversity. You don't get a little bit of Buddhism and a little bit of... No, if you're winning with Jesus, you're all in. So those 40% that aren't even... You're not following him. Why? Well, we're all tempted in this. In fact, if you look at the temptations of Jesus, we don't have time to do it today, but Matthew chapter 4, you'll see he's not eaten for 40 days and he says, turn these stones to bread. What's wrong with that? Hmm. Feed people. That's a good thing. Feed yourself. That'd probably feel really good. Throw yourself from the top of this temple. And then he quotes Satan, quotes scripture. Most Christians are like, there's a verse. I mean, I'm good. I don't know. People saying a lot of different things that don't agree, and they're using verses. Context. Don't test the Lord your God. But you can have political power, Jesus, and you just got to bow down and worship me. He's already a king. And you can have all the power. So you get a social agenda, you want to feed people social justice, you get a political agenda. Like it's, all, it's like, guys, what's bad about that? No, a king with no cross is an impotent Messiah. He's powerful, temporarily, but you and I are separated from God eternally. All the temptations are temptations to diverge from the mission that God has given him, the cross. We have a plethora of of opportunities to diverge from what God has for us. Make disciples. Duplicates of Jesus. Invest what has Jesus has done in you to transform you into other people. And it'll look different in their life than it does in yours. And it looks different in your life than it did in Peter's. But we're becoming like Jesus and we're all in process. The only way to do it, all in. Even the reason why I said the outline that I've given you. No reserve, no retreat. No regret. Comes from a missionary. His name is William Borden. William Borden was born into the Borden uh, milk family. Those of you who are lactose intolerant, never heard of them, I understand. Um, But William Borden uh, was born into this family, so he got a huge inheritance. 
And when he graduated from high school, 1904, in Chicago, his family gave him a gift that he would travel around the world, which is great for, like, becoming more cultured. And, you know, you hear people today, I'm going to walk through Europe and find myself. You're like, you're right here. You don't need to go look at this right there. He wasn't trying to find himself. In fact, what happened for him was he became burdened for hurting people as he saw how other people lived around the world. So when he started his first year at Yale, he started a Bible study to try and make disciples of the people at Yale. Had 150 students by the end of his freshman year. By the end of his senior year, there were 1,300 students at Yale in Bible studies because of what he had started. He told one of his good friends, I think I'm going to go be a missionary. And his friend said, you're throwing your life away because you've got money and intelligence. Why would you do that? And he went to seminary at Princeton. And when he was done at seminary at Princeton, he was headed to China, but he had a burden for Muslim people in China. So he wanted to learn Arabic and stopped in Egypt. While he was there, he got spinal meningitis and died. 25 years old. Never made it to China. In Cairo, on his gravestone, it says essentially... Uh, the only explanation for his life is Jesus. Well, the American newspapers found out about his death because it took, they didn't have TikTok. It took a little longer, 1904. Um, the country grieved a 25-year-old who had given away all of his wealth. And one article even said, but the life makes sense in light of who he was because he was with Christ. And later they found his Bible and on the last page it said, no reserve, no retreat, no regret. So maybe like his friend in Yale, you hear that and think he threw his life away. Or if you understand the mission of Jesus and what the disciples are experiencing in this moment, you're like, he threw it away for Jesus and it's playing in perpetuity now. Thousands of lives impacted, some of yours today. And while he never got to where he thought he was going to go, he did exactly what God wanted. He was all in. And he was going for it. That's the no retreat. Going, going. So, so Bible scholars, they debate. Does go, is going a command or is going a participle? And so it's as you go, just as you're living life. And the reality is context determines both the context of the text and the context of your life when you go to apply it. The context of the text, it's all authority, and therefore, and it connects the go. And it comes before, but it's interesting because that's one of the three participles in the passage. It's an aorist participle, and all that means is this. An aorist participle typically is used for something that precedes the main verb. It's happened already, or simultaneously with the main verb. So making disciples. If you're already making disciples, as you're going, so both can be true, but you can't just sit here or hang out with just people who all believe what you already believe. You gotta go. So for some people, it means leaving. For some people, it's as you're living. Your context will dictate the application and you can honestly approach the text and say either one in this context. But what's really clear is then you're gonna go get them and rescue them out so they experience life transformation, not just information, baptizing, And the kind of teaching you're giving is not just to impart information. It's so that their life is changed in a way that they live different. And they're told to do this. Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, the uttermost parts of the world. But wait here. You don't have power of the Holy Spirit. And then they don't do it if you read Acts. But then Acts 8.1. They don't obey. God goes, we'll kill one of you, Stephen. And now they're scared and they scatter. Guess where they go? Judea. Samaria, that's how we've heard. Hmm. God will accomplish his mission. Will you accept the invitation in? And it's not a retreat, and by that I mean you don't pull back because we're on the offensive, and most of us miss that. One of the things we did when we were in Israel is I I took our group to Caesarea Philippi, which is beautiful. It's in the region of Galilee, but it's not right by the Galilee Sea or lake or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's not where most of the people were at actually either. And so when we got there, I asked the group, I said, why did Jesus bring these guys here? Because it's really beautiful. There's a spring of water, big mountain. They worship the God Pan there. And so it'd be the equivalent of me um, coming to you and saying, hey, when God called us to come plant this church in Raleigh, you've heard me probably say if you've been here any amount of time, he didn't call us to fill up a church. He called us to reach a city for Jesus. So 
Like if I just walk down, I'm, James, here's what we're going to do. I grab one, two or three of you, and I'm like, here, we're going to go to the roughest part of town. And where would that be for some of you? It's got to be by Duke because they're terrible. No, it's got to be by. <laughs> like, what would you think? What would you think? And I tried to do research on this. I couldn't find any article that said, this is the worst part of Raleigh, Durham. No one wants to say that. But the majority of crime actually takes place in Raleigh by uh, Big Wake, if you know that, over on Newburn Avenue. My wife works there. She had a guy try to get in her car the other day when she was leaving work. Well, that's weird. Pray for her. Um, 619 crimes in five years there, 57 of them violent crimes right in that one block area. Maybe you go there. Uh, What Jesus is taking them to in Caesarea Philippi is the red light district. So you're these guys. Jesus says he's got all authority. He takes you to the red light district. They're doing things there that I can't say to you. It's too terrible. One of the things they do that I can say there is they would kill goats and they'd throw it into the water uh, because it was believed, they worshiped the god Pan there, and it was believed that the water had no end to it. It flows into this big cave, and they thought it was the gateway to the underworld. In Mark chapter 8 and in Matthew chapter 16, the same account is told. In Matthew chapter 16, it's the first time the word church is used in the New Testament. That's where Jesus says to Peter, on this rock I'll build my church. And we get all twisted about, are the Catholics right? Is it Peter and the succession of Peter or the priest? Or is it Jesus is saying he's the rock or is on his teaching? Or was there a rock? I don't know. But here's what I know. They're standing in front of the gates of hell and the next statement he makes, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Huh. Interesting statement and way to translate it. Because gates don't attack anything. Gates are defensive. We're the ones attacking death and darkness. The gates, we're storming the gates of hell. And they're not going to stand, remain, prevail. They're not going to defeat us. Jesus is life. And we're taking that aggressively going to where the dark places are. Here's the problem. We retreat. We live our comfortable Christian lives. If one of you dies next week in a crack house on Newburn Avenue, Christians will think about you. I didn't know they had a drug problem. Why don't we think, oh wow, they must have befriended some crack dealers and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time? Because of our culture, where we hide and we retreat and we build our own gates. That's not the plan. That's retreating. No retreat. We're on the offensive. Problem is, we put ourselves in places <laughs> where we don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. We got this. Our own cultural system, our own art, our own music, our own clothing lines, school, like everything to where eventually, like, yes, have one of us run out there and tell somebody about Jesus. Then we'll talk about it for like the next 12 months. So as you're living your life in a world of darkness that you don't belong to, you don't have a citizenship here, this isn't your place, but you're attacking this place with the life of Jesus. And most people will say no. The road is broad that leads to destruction and narrow that leads to life. But you're on the winning team. Keep going. The dividends and perpetuity. Don't retreat. I'm with you. And I have all authority. So go to all the nations. And by the way, God's everywhere all the time. This is his manifest presence. You only get to experience it while living on mission with him. It's a tangible expression. When I say manifest presence, is you experience his presence in these moments. The problem is most of us won't because most of us are never in a spot where all we need is Jesus and nothing will work unless Jesus does something. But when we read our Bible, we go, well, how, the red, how come I can't see the Red Sea? Were you, are you in a spot where your enemy's coming down on you and there's water and in desert? Nope. That required faith. Just huddle up, keep eating our onions, and be in oppression. Live of this culture and be conformed. One of the reasons why Michael Jordan took the Nike deal is because his Olympic coach, the movie apparently does not show this. It was not just Matt Damon's uh, persuasive techniques. Uh, His Olympic coach kept saying, try something different. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people buy Macintosh. The crazy ones, the innovators, but 80% of us probably have them. (laughs) Uh, Most of us want to not conform to culture, but we're not transformed by God's word. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
And if we were, we'd be like Hannah. I'm barren unless you come through. We'd be like, just pick, uh, Jarius with his daughter? I, I need you. Uh, the centurion who comes and says, I'm a man with authority. I understand authority. You just say the word. and I'll Until we're at a spot where all we have is Jesus, we don't realize all we need is Jesus. So we'll sing songs like that, but then we live, we're diverse portfolio. I've got my skills and I've got these people that I, and I got the bank account and I got the 401k and I got, I got a backup plan. I got, are you on with Jesus? Like when I'm singing that song at church, but not now. Information, an application, fail. And no regret. The people who don't regret is when you stand with your maker and you did what you were made for. There's an Ecclesiastes version of life, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And then there's a Psalm version, in your presence is fullness of joy. Marcus Aurelius was the last emperor of Pax Romana. He had a quote, and he said, the only life that matters, the one that lasts, the only wealth with which you will keep forever is that which you give away. And that's what the call of Christianity is, if anyone, but not in America and today, if anyone, come follow me, take up a cross, deny yourself, all in, and there'll be no regret. In our passage, we're told to go duplicate, to multiply. That's always been the plan. Genesis 1, we're made in his image, made man in his image. That's the vision. You're going to reflect my image. Uh, verse 28, 7 is that. Verse 28 is the mission. Here's how you do it. Be fruitful and multiply. Problem, Genesis chapter 3. We diverge from the mission. We think there's a plan other than God's plan. It might be a better plan. Um, so then sin enters the world. We keep sinning until Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, 5, it says that all that's multiplying is wickedness. It's what man thought about all the time. And so what we kept doing was more and more wickedness. So God sends a flood, wipes it all out. We're going to hit the reset button on the video game, right? Mike Tyson's punch out. I lost a glass, Joe. Start over. By Genesis chapter 11, they're building a tower. It's known as the passage of the Tower of Babel. Do you know what the problem was in the Tower of Babel? It's not their engineering. It wasn't that they all spoke the same language. It was that they were building a tower for their own name. They diverge from the mission. You're my image bearers. You reflect my name. You're supposed to multiply that glory. No? Nope. Okay. So he gives them different languages. There's confusion. Now they're fighting against each other, not just building up their own name. And, and then all through the Old Testament, it's, it's for the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 6. You're supposed to be a light to the nations, Israel, but they didn't do it. So then he tells us in the New Testament, you're the salt and light of the world. Are we doing it? Uh, there's no book on it, so I can't say... And then you'll be my witnesses. And we know how it ends. You want to know if there's regret? If you're a part of that, there won't be regret. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. There's an arc of multiplication of the glory of God's name all through the Bible, and it ends this way. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white clothes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and Jesus is the lamb and you're invited into that that's a pretty sweet deal you think Jesus knew what he was doing he said you got to give it all up but you have eternal life and multiplication of eternal blessings walk on a mission with me a lot of people say they follow Jesus and aren't following. Don't be one of them. Father, we come before you. I pray that every person here who is part of our church, for sure the members, uh, for sure those who call this church home, that we would live no reserve, no regret, no retreat, that we have the sword of the Spirit. We've got the Holy Spirit. And yeah, there's a battle, there's a spiritual battle, but you've given us the word of truth and to rescue people out of darkness and out of death and we don't lose anything in the process? goodness. God, give us a burden and a passion for that. Help us to see that. Help us to give it to our kids. Help us to equip them for this world. Help us to give it to our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members, our friends. Help our hearts to break for those who don't know you. And, and 
remove some of our insecurities. None of us have this all figured out. None of us knows all the answers. Because as we're going, what we're learning, that we'd impart that to other people, that you give a spiritual transformation that overflows out of our lives and other people would be transformed. A disciple, under your authority, and you have all authority. A disciple, being transformed. So I say baptizing and continuing to impart that lives on mission with you, teaching to obey. Obey, do what you say. I pray that we would. Help us to live lives that are part of your plan and not our own. And to not be able to leave here today and just be nice, moral people. I have to be called to more. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to sermons from Southbridge Fellowship in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you have a question about the message you just heard, email us at info at sfchurch.com. For additional resources or service information, visit us at sfchurch.com.